What is going on everybody? Welcome back. Welcome to the reveal of the number 23 team in my 2020 NFL Power Rankings. Da Bears. Before we hop in, a quick reminder, please do hit that like button down below guys. It really helps me out. Helps this video get more views, support this channel. It's the easiest way to do it right there. So I appreciate you in advance for that. So this Bears team, in my opinion, has very quickly become the golden standard, the golden example, if you will, of two of the most common disconnects between casual football fans and reality when it comes to analyzing the game of football. And that is one, the idea that championship windows are a real thing in the NFL. And when you miss your window, like the Bears did in 2017, they really double doinked it with an unbelievable roster things can fall off way quicker than most fans want to admit, especially when combined with my second point here, and that is that having an exceptional quarterback is more important than most fans want to admit, and that winning 10 games on a year-to-year -year basis without that elite quarterback who consistently elevates the play of those around him is borderline impossible. Now, that's a tangent for another time, but I do think that that conversation surrounding championship windows is very relevant to the 2020 Bears team because in reality, this team is very much like many defensive-minded teams over the last five years or so, such as the Broncos and Jags who had one season where everything clicked. They had a ton of success despite poor quarterback play. And then for several years after that, they have a few too many member berries and think they can just recreate the good old days, if you will. But unfortunately, what seems to always happen to these teams is too many players regress from age. They leave in free agency. Oftentimes, these defensive-minded teams witnessed a lot of good fortune with injuries, winning a high percentage of close games. And once that new league year turns around, it becomes virtually impossible to recreate that magic from the year before, or in this Bears team's case, two years before. And these teams find themselves in a bit of a purgatory. And I really think that's kind of where this Bears team is right now. But all that said, this team still has a lot of talent that I'm really excited to cover in this deep dive. And maybe they can be the exception to the rule in 2020 for a defensive-minded team with a poor quarterback and recreate that 2018 magic. And I'll even say that based on a lot of comments so far, people are surprised that it took me this long to reveal the Bears down here at 23, surrounded by a lot of playoff hopeful teams. So I promise Bears fans, this won't be all doom and gloom from me. And if you're new to the series, what we do here is we go through the roster, we rank each position, how they stack up against the rest of the league. While we do that, we'll be looking at my own custom Madden roster. Yes, it is a video game, but it's a really nice copyright free graphic that I get to use to show you how I perceive each player. So just keep that in mind. Then after that, we're gonna take a look at this team's schedule, go game by game, talk about this team's Vegas over under and my win total expectations for this team. So without further ado, let's get into the roster here, starting with the quarterback position where they are going to rank 30th. And we don't even know at this point who's going to be starting. And you have two very different options here. So you've got Mitch Trubisky, who at this point, like you can go back to what we said about Mitch Trubisky in last year's deep dive and just apply it to this year. He just hasn't developed. He's showing the same problems as far as being a first read quarterback. The more and more problems he shows, Matt Nagy is simplifying the offense, making it easier for defenses to key in on what's happening, which makes it even worse because Mitch, when those first reads are bottled up, and sometimes he doesn't even make the first read correctly, but when that first read gets bottled up, he is incredibly unpredictable. Let's just leave it at that. And he'll show some flashes. He'll make some really great plays. There's a quarter here, a half here scattered throughout the season where getting excited about Mitch Trubisky is justified. Like he's a fantastic athlete. His arm talent's phenomenal. There's parts of the season where he can be very accurate and utilize the entire field in the passing game. The problem is getting it on a consistent, not even game to game basis, just quarter to quarter basis at this stage, it's, it's probably just never gonna happen. But the upside, quote unquote, is supposedly in there with Mitch Trubisky if everything can click mentally. But that to me is like, I don't know, less than 2% likely uh, if you're going to put a number on it so they bring in nick Foles, which actually isn't a bad move now 
I don't think there's any luster left from Nick Foles' Super Bowl championship. Talk about championship windows and surrounding a team with the option to win uh, without elite quarterback play. Now Nick Foles magically played great in that playoff run, so he's, he's kind of a wild animal in that conversation. But if you go back to what I said about Foles in the Jags deep dive last year, Nobody that watched that video was surprised to see that be a total train wreck in Jacksonville after they literally lied to their players and fan base that he was a franchise quarterback just because they paid him like one. He is a backup quarterback. Now, he's a very good backup quarterback. And quite frankly, he might be a top 32 quarterback in the league, depending on how you feel about guys like Trubisky and... Dwayne Haskins and these young kind of higher upside prospects, Nick Foles just might give you a higher floor than a guy like Mitch Trubisky. So it makes sense why they brought him in. They didn't have a first round pick to address the quarterback situation through the draft. And I think Matt Nagy feels very confident in his ability as an offensive coordinator. And he says, hey, if I can just have a quarterback that I actually know what I'm going to get on a play-to-play -play basis, yeah, it might limit what I can call, but I at least know it's going to get executed on a consistent basis. And with this defense, this might be a better option than this boomer bust polarizing week-to-week -week action that we're getting from Mitch Trubisky. So totally different options at quarterback. Neither are very promising. If you want my answer on who should start here, I'm going to go with Nick Foles. I just think it's time to move on from Mitch Trubisky. And if, if things completely don't work with Nick Foles, then you just roll the dice and see if something crazy happens with Trubisky. And maybe him getting benched lights a fire under his ass and gets him to spend some extra time in the film room or whatever he needs to get to where he needs to be. I think it should be Nick Foles here because you know what you're going to get. You know this defense is, is going to kick ass and take names. But with his sort of lack of arm strength, lack of mobility, it is really going to limit the upside of your offense, but it's definitely going to increase the floor as well. Either way you slice it though, it's not an ideal situation. They are going to rank 30th and everyone knows that that is the number one thing holding this Bears team back. I'm in no way being contrarian to say that. I think that's, that's a consensus opinion at this point, even if it wasn't last year. When a lot of Bears fans were saying Trubisky was going to win MVP and was the best quarterback in the NFC North. You're looking a little foolish at this point. But anyway, let's move on through the rest of this roster. We're going to run through the running back room here really quickly. It's, it's pretty basic. You've got David Montgomery, who had a, a bit of a disappointing rookie season. I think he was fine. He just he didn't do look exactly like he did in college, which was constantly making the first guy miss, running for extra yards. And even in the preseason, it looked like he was going to be able to transfer that over at the NFL level, but it just didn't show when the regular season started. Uh, maybe year two will be different for him. I don't know. He's just not an exceptional athlete, and it could be that he's just now at the next level, just a, a smidgen, even a quarter of a step slower. He's not able to get those angles that he got in college, and he's just not going to be maybe Le'Veon Bell or whatever, but he's a good, solid starting caliber back in my eyes. I, I don't know if I'm expecting too much different in year two, though. Uh, and then you have Tariq Cohen, who's a phenomenal kind of scat back out of the backfield. One of the better receiving backs in the league really fell off last year because this entire offense was a disaster. And that could obviously help David Montgomery as well. Uh, and I think with Foles in there, I think you're going to get some more consistent action uh, with Tariq Cohen. If it's Trubisky, it might be more of the same though. Uh, and that's really all it is at the running back room. You have Ryan Nall, who's going to be maybe kind of the third uh, depth piece here, maybe a little fullback action. They don't use a lot of fullback. They have about 20,000 tight ends on this roster anyway. Uh, but that's really all it is. It's Montgomery and Cohen. It's nothing special. They rank 28th, but it's fine. They're just running backs. Uh, then we've got the wide receiver room, and this has fallen down quite a bit over the last few years. Now, you do have Allen Robinson that I, I really like. I've always been a big Allen Robinson truther. The guy has just never had consistent quarterback play. I still think he's in the top 10 discussion. He just doesn't put up the numbers and the consistency that you would normally see from a top 10 guy. But he has every trait for a true number one elite wide receiver. He can separate on all three levels of the defense. He's got excellent hands. He's got run after the catch. He's great personality. Like there's really nothing bad to say about Allen Robinson. I'm probably even higher on him than most. 
but the rest of this group here is just lackluster. So you do have Anthony Miller, who was my number two wide receiver in the 2018 class. I, I really like Miller, but he has not really blown up beyond anything other than a quality, almost third option in the passing game. He's shown a lot of flashes and he's kind of the piece you look at to say, all right, if they're gonna exceed this ranking of 25th, it's going to be because Anthony Miller finally takes that step up in year three. I obviously believe he can do it. It's just difficult to project him to do that with another year of very questionable quarterback play. But in college, he looked a lot like almost Antonio Brown as a smaller receiver, but he's quick, great route running, great contested catch ability, run after catch. Like he just, he killed it. And I thought he was going to be a lot better in the pros. Just hasn't shown quite yet. He's now for the second year in a row, kind of a lot of people's breakout candidate. I just don't know if that's going to happen without seriously improved quarterback play. And then you got a pretty big drop off after that. Um, I do like Riley Ridley and Javon Wims. Both these guys, you know, I, Ridley, I had a late first, early second round grade on. I think he's a really good wide receiver. Hasn't gotten a lot of opportunities here. Javon Wims, I thought was a fourth round prospect. I think those are really good values. And they got another one this year and Darnell Mooney fell a little bit. Just these guys kind of dropping in deeper wide receiver classes. I, I do think there's a lot of talent and potential in the depth there, but these guys are just young, unproven. And until they show that, I'm not gonna rank them as a top 20 unit because that's really the majority of this group is Allen Robinson and then a bunch of talented but unproven youth like we just mentioned. And then you have Ted Ginn, he actually is a good vertical threat. I do see him getting a lot of playing time here. He doesn't do a whole lot for me, and it's not like these quarterbacks are gonna get the most out of Ted Ginn, but he's a good decoy um, and adds some speed in there, who I actually think will kind of start as the number two guy with um, in, in three wide receiver packages with Miller being more of the slot. Uh, so that does help. And then you have Trevor Davis, Alex Wesley, just a bunch of nobodies that probably will not be making this team. And then the tight end room, they take Cole Komet in the second round. Him and Jimmy Graham are probably both gonna get a lot of playing time here. The Jimmy Graham signing was one of the worst of the offseason. I, I mean, when Green Bay signed him to 10 million a year, it was already like, he's kind of a zombie of what he used to be. And then he looked even worse in Green Bay. His hands have disappeared now, so now he doesn't block. He is not athletic anymore, and now he doesn't win contested catches. He is basically just taking up space. So I don't think he's a starting caliber player. Honestly, I don't know what role he serves in the NFL when he doesn't get open, he doesn't catch, and he doesn't block. And he's not gonna play on special teams. So I, I honestly don't know what Jimmy Graham is gonna do here. We'll see. I think Cole Komet, I, I was definitely lower on him. He was my number two tight end in this class. Decent blocker, good hands, but not a mismatch problem. He's not going to win in man coverage, especially against modern linebackers. So I think he's a good high floor pick. I would not have taken him in the second round. Uh, you do have Demetrius Harris, who can be kind of an interesting mismatch problem, kind of a cheaper version of Trey Burton, very similar kind of player, I think. Uh, you got Ben Broniker, who's a, a decent depth piece. We could do a deep dive into this tight end room alone. It's ridiculous how many tight ends they have. Adam Shaheen was a second round pick in 2017. At this point, I'm just hoping, if I were a Bears fan, I'd be hoping that he can at least figure it out as a blocker, because he is a massive dude. I think he's listed at like 265, maybe more than that, but he when he's on the field, he looks like he's 280 pounds. So I would hope that he can establish himself as a blocker, because other than Cole Komet, you don't really have that blocking presence. At least maybe you can get a good run game going here. You even have JP Holtz who showed some flashes. Uh, actually, it was Jesper Horstead who showed some flashes, a converted college receiver. Eric Saubert out of Oakland. Like, why do they have so many tight ends? I don't know. They clearly want to make that a part of this offense. It would make sense with Nick Foles. He had a lot of success with those tight ends in Philadelphia. So maybe that's kind of, we want to run the ball. We want to do some more play action. We want to get the short passing game going. I understand it. They're kind of throwing a lot of resources at this position, but I don't think any of these guys are going to give you what you want. So the tight end room really doesn't do much for me at all. There's a lot of names here, but I really think it's one of the worst in the league. And ultimately what you end up with is Allen Robinson, who is to me still an elite wide receiver that frankly, maybe can't wait to get out of here and 
maybe go choose an actual quarterback this time around because he's still only like 26, 27 years old. And then after him, it's just this mishmash of whatever word you want to throw at it other than anything great or even good. So 25th with the wide receiver ranking. I don't want to say it's it's an awful room, and I think Matt Nagy is going to find some creative ways to get these guys involved. I do think he's a solid play caller. Despite what a lot of Bears fans would say, I think he's had to adjust a lot due to Mitch Trubisky being his quarterback. Uh, so he's got plenty of chess pieces to move around a lot of different skill sets. It's just a matter of these guys clicking and finding their roles, which is going to be really tough for this team to do, I think. I know I'm talking in circles here, but I think it's kind of a faceless receiving group, if that makes sense. So let's move on to the offensive line. It's it's a really solid group. The problem here is their right guard position. They did virtually nothing to address it after Kyle Long retired. Now, Long didn't play much last year, and Rashad Coward, uh, Rashad Coward a converted defensive lineman, a converted undrafted defensive lineman in 2017, started at right guard and it was really bad like one of the worst guards in football bad so is he gonna start again or is it gonna be Jermaine Effetti now that's that could work he's an a good athlete he's really struggled at tackle for Seattle but I could see him actually coming in starting at guard I have a hard time believing he wouldn't beat out Rashad Coward so that could work that's really the big question mark here the rest of this unit is the same as it's been Charles Leno at left tackle James Daniels and Cody Whitehair these guys keep bouncing between left guard and center they kind of um, flipped back last year about midway through and James Daniel really clicked at guard and Whitehair is gonna be good wherever you play him um, they did a good job to lock him up so I think we're going to see Daniels at left guard and Whitehair at center because this line really was better when they made that change. I think you'll stick with that. And then you got uh, Bobby Massey at right tackle there. Their tackle duo is still very good. It's aging, but I still think it'll be a solid top 15 or so tackle duo. So as long as Afedi can kick in at right guard, who knows, maybe uh, one of these two seventh round flyers that they picked up in uh Simmons and Hambright, maybe they're diamonds in the rough. And then they also really good pick up Jason Spriggs. He's played some guard, played some tackle for Green Bay. Uh, we know it's been a deep offensive line there. And he was a second round pick and really good athlete out of Indiana. So he's another guy that's going to push at right guard. So between Spriggs, Coward, and Effetti, all guys with a lot of experience in this league, I think you're going to emerge probably not with a good right guard, but at least a serviceable one and probably an upgrade to what Coward gave you at right guard last year. Also got to keep an eye on Alex Bars. Didn't hate him coming out of Notre Dame, but he's kind of an undrafted uh, bottom of the depth chart guy here. So the offensive line is very solid. They do rank 14th. It's definitely a unit that's going to allow Matt Nagy to call what he wants to call and trust that this offensive line can get in guys' ways. Now, they're not going to be a, an elite mauling group, I don't think buying all this time and getting all this push in the run game for some prolific offense but I do think that it's probably the best part of this offense obviously I rank them the highest of the units but ultimately it's an offense that's very very difficult to predict what we're going to see necessarily it's even tough if you couldn't tell to kind of put all these pieces together as I'm talking about it because there's a ton of new bodies there's a lot of youth with the playmakers you've got two different quarterbacks you've got a head coach that's shown a lot of creativity but has been hampered over, over recent years with Trubisky. But I think he's got a vision here. I don't know if all of the moves, guys like Jimmy Graham necessarily, Cole Komet, lack of a true three down back maybe. You know, there's still some missing elements of this team, but you've got different skill sets at receiver, tight end, running back, even two different skill sets at quarterback. It's going to be an interesting year for Matt Nagy. And I like that he has an offensive line to kind of mold all this group together. But let's just say he's got a lot of work to do. The offense ranks 29th right now as we sit here. And it's really just going to be wait and see with this group. But as we flip over to Chuck Pagano's defense here, we can get much more optimistic. And this, just like we talked about with the Chargers in our last deep dive, it's not a coincidence that these two teams come extremely close together. They're very close. Um, but I do think this defense is even a step up from that Chargers defense. Um, they are a phenomenal unit. And spoiler alert, they're actually going to come in 
top 10 for all four of our categories here, run defense, pass rush, linebacker, and defensive back. And they have a united culture. If there's fans in the seats this year, they will have that home field advantage that this crowd can get rocking. If this team is going to rebirth 2017, it's gonna be thanks to this defense led by Khalil Mack and Chuck Pagano and a lot of really talented players here. So let's hop in, let's run through the run defense. They are the third ranked run defense in the league. They have been incredible at this really since Matt Nagy got here. I don't think it's thanks to Matt Nagy, but whether it's been Vic Fangio or Chuck Pagano here, these guys are badasses up front. They're athletic beasts that are disciplined and tough. I just, you can't really say enough about this run defense. It starts with Eddie Goldman, Akeem Hicks in the middle. Now Hicks, I kind of, you know, warned this in last year's deep dive, the guy's had a lot of injury problems throughout his career and he stayed healthy in 2017. It was gonna be difficult to predict that to stay the same in 2018, and that could be the case again here in 2019. He's gotta stay healthy, but they have so much depth here that even if Hicks isn't there for the whole year, or if he regresses or whatever, they've got a lot of pieces here, especially in run defense, for this to still be a dominant unit. So Eddie Goldman is just one of the best nose tackles in the league, and when Hicks is out there, it's an elite interior duo. And then you have Bilal Nichols, who's a really talented athlete that was better in 2018 than in 2019, but I've got some faith that he can um, stay relevant on this team. Roy Robertson Harris took a huge step up last year. He will defend the run. He's kind of that smaller bodied interior, bigger bodied edge guy that plays a lot of kind of four tech here, base three, four end, but he's impressive. They bring back John Jenkins that had his best year in Miami last year after being a like a deep rotational piece here in Chicago for years. They signed Brent Urban who can play the run and then they draft Travis Gibson who's very similar to Roy Robertson Harris as that kind of hybrid 3-4 end. The D line here, it, especially when you talk about run defense, is just remarkable how deep they are. And then you mix in Khalil Mack who is unstoppable, like trying to block him in the run game. Robert Quinn, I see really as more of a rotational pass rusher here. He's not much of a run defender, and they don't really have a big body guy here. If they still had um, Lynch in that role, I think it would would help. Um, I think losing him is going to hurt. Maybe Travis Gibson will play some of that outside linebacker edge um, on early downs, or even Roy Robertson Harris, I think, could do it. I don't think Barkevius Mingo is going to be that guy. So I will say if there's a if there's a hole in this run defense, it's going to be the edge contain group opposite of Khalil Mack. Um, but you do have Roquan Smith who has elite sideline to sideline makeup speed on those more outside oriented runs. And then Danny Trevathan's a really good linebacker as well. So just a, a dominant front seven. Uh, you can make a pretty strong case to be made that this is the best front seven in the league. And that translates to the pass rush here that ranks second. And when you have Khalil Mack, who in my eyes is still the best uh, edge rusher in the league, the best pass rusher in the league, not named Aaron Donald, it's it's just going to help you. He had a, a bit of a down year last year, but that still made him one of the best players in the NFL when he had a down year. I fully expect him to bring that fear factor and be at worst a top three edge player again next season. And then they bring in Robert Quinn, who from a pass rushing perspective is an upgrade to Leonard Floyd. He is just more explosive. He's more crafty. He's actually got counter moves unlike Leonard Floyd. Now he's not going to bring as much in run defense or in coverage that Leonard Floyd did. He's not going to bring the same flexibility, but strictly speaking as a third down edge pass rusher, Khalil Mack and Robert Quinn has got to be one of the best duos in the league. And then you have interior presence as well. You have Akeem Hicks, hopefully, is going to stay healthy this year. Even if he plays eight games, he's going to be a top 10 interior rusher and a dominant run defender. Um, but it's not just him. You've got Bilal Nichols and Roy Robertson. Harris can get some push on the inside in a bit of a rotation. So they rank second for pass rush. You are predicting a little bit of a return to 2017 Khalil Mack uh, if you're going to get that number two. But I do really like bringing in Robert Quinn. The more I think about it, my first reaction was that was an overpay, but the more I think about it, it made a lot more sense. 
The last thing I'll say here though is there's just not a lot of depth in the edge room at all. You have Barkevius Mingo and James Vodders and Isaiah Irving. So if Robert Quinn or Khalil Mack do get hurt, you're really in trouble with that edge group. I think you'd have to make a free agent signing at that point, but your one and two are phenomenal uh, on the edge. So second for pass rush, and then the linebacking group here is really good as well. They rank seventh. Roquan really came on late in last year. It, it took a little bit for him to get up to speed in the NFL, I think. Uh, but I, I have a lot of expectations for him to kind of take a step up here in year three. I think linebacker is there with kind of tight end as a very versatile position. You got to do a lot of different things, right? You got to have zone understanding. You got to understand leverage and man coverage. You got to understand run defense and understand uh, sort of schemes in the run. And, and you've got to beef up a little bit like Roquan coming into the NFL. So I I think this is a big year for Roquan. I fully expect him to play like a top 10 linebacker this year. Maybe that's optimistic, but I mean, I thought he was a blue chip prospect coming out. I thought it was an excellent pick, the last missing piece on this defense. And I think we might get that this year from Roquan. Now, Danny Trevathan seems to be on the downward trajectory. I was a little surprised they were able to retain him, but they did. They're really hinging on him staying healthy, which has been a knock on him over his career. They lost Kwiatkowski here. They lost Kevin Pierre-Lewis, who stepped up in the event of injury here and played pretty damn well. So honestly, between Trevathan and Hicks, right now they're healthy and you definitely hope that they can stay healthy. I would say those are two pretty major question marks for the upside of this defense in the middle of, of this unit that could go wrong. You do have as depth Joel... Igbuniway, Ig, Igbununi, Igbuniway, Ig, Igbuniway was a fourth round pick in 2018. More of a raw, uh, exceptional athlete. If my memory serves me right, he's converting from uh, kind of an edge position at Western Kentucky. Uh, so maybe in year three, he can take some strides up. They, they must see something they like in his development because they went from a really deep unit last year with Kwiatkowski and Pierre Lewis to now a very thin unit. So got to stay healthy in that linebacker group, but between Trevathan and Roquan Smith, you've got an excellent duo. They're going to rank seventh. And then we get to the secondary here where they're going to rank ninth. And you have Kyle Fuller, who's a really good, I, I would say a number one corner. He's on the very back end of, of guys that I would consider number one corners. He's just a very good all-around corner. He's really instinctive in zone. He's a little bit like Casey Hayward, who we talked about with the Chargers. I would say just maybe not quite as, as heady and instinctive, but very good corner nonetheless. Really good ball skills. Uh, and then the number two corner is going to be a competition between Artie Burns, who's a really low-end starting caliber player for Pittsburgh. He's one of those guys that when he when he gets beat, he gets beat really bad and then gets a really bad rap. But he's a really good athlete. He started a lot of games in this league. It wouldn't be ideal if he's starting. This team likes to run a lot of zone coverage. I think he's more of a man cover scheme kind of guy, but I like his athleticism. But I like him much more as the fourth corner here if Jalen Johnson a rookie corner out of Utah can win that starting job. And I fully expect that he will. Johnson uh, was one of the highest floor corners in last year's class, if not the highest floor corner outside of, I suppose, Jeff Okuda. Uh, but if you're going to run a lot of zone coverage here, Jalen Johnson's going to be very comfortable at that. He's lengthy, he's physical in press, and he already comes with a heavy understanding of route recognition and when and where to kind of make breaks and when to stay put. Like he's just a very heady player. He's not an elite athlete, but he's a good enough athlete. And he certainly makes up with any lack of athleticism with his length. So I have a lot of confidence in Jalen Johnson, clearly ranking this defense backfield uh, as ninth in the league, because I like that cornerback duo, even as a rookie for Jalen Johnson. Um, and then in the slot, you're, you're going to be in pretty good shape. So you have Buster Screen, who's not what Bryce Callahan was for this team in 2018, but he's fine. He's really quick. He will get beat. He will get taken advantage of at times for his size. He's a very slim guy and he's very aggressive. So sometimes that can burn him, but I'm, I'm comfortable with him in the slot. But also keep an eye on Duke Shelley, a sixth round pick in 2019. Was a really good slot corner in that class. I think in year two, he might actually push Buster Screen, uh, depending on how well Screen's playing at his age. And even Artie Burns might be able to push for a slot corner spot. 
So I think they'll take a bit of an open competition approach um, in that slot spot, but I think they're gonna emerge with three starting caliber corners, which is good. And then you actually have some interesting depth as well. It is a fairly deep unit. So you've got um, Sherrick McManus, a veteran that's been around here that's actually shown that he can play in a pinch. He's been a special teamer here for a long time, but when called upon, he's been serviceable. They take Kendall Vilder in the fifth round this year. He could challenge for a nickel spot as well. He is a player I liked. He's an exceptional athlete coming out of a lower level of competition. Definitely took a, a drop off uh, from year three to year four at Georgia Southern, but uh, definitely the kind of athlete you want to gamble on. So I like that pick in the fifth round. And then you even have some interesting names, some good athletes, guys that were good college players. Uh, Steven Denmark, a converted college receiver, Kevin Tolliver, Michael Joseph, Xavier Crawford. It's, it's a very deep room of corners with a lot of guys that are going to come in and compete. So I feel pretty good. You're going to merge with a, a solid corner room, if, if not solid above average. And then the safety group's pretty good too. So you have Eddie Jackson, Still one of the better free safeties in the league. A guy that did not have as much success in 2019 as he did in 2018. He's a very aggressive guy. I think he actually really benefited from having Adrian Amos next to him, who is one of the more steady conservative safeties in the league. And I think having a guy more like him in HaHa ha Clinton Dix, who's going to be a little more aggressive and put himself out there a little more like Clinton Dix does, it actually hurt Eddie Jackson because he maybe had to uh, realize that he can't always be that ball hawking type without Amos next to him. Uh, so they bring in Tashawn Gibson, who I think can be more of that Adrian Amos role on this defense. I think Eddie Jackson is gonna play off that a lot better and uh, resubmit his name as a top five free safety after a bit of a down year last year. And then Deion Bush played pretty valiantly in a, in a rotational safety role last year as well. I think he could take a step up and potentially even beat out uh, to Sean Gibson. But I like those, those three guys because these guys are all going to get on the field, right? A lot of teams are running three safeties. Uh, everyone uses three safeties at some point. So uh, I like Jackson, Bush, and to Sean Gibson. Jordan Lucas is another interesting name to keep an eye on. He's been depth for Kansas City. Uh, Kentrell Bryce is on this team. I don't know why he's still getting opportunities. He's a miserable player. Uh, but all in all, it's a very deep secondary. I don't think it's ever gonna be an elite secondary this year, but I love the depth. You've got some star players there in Fuller and Eddie Jackson to help elevate these guys. So uh, big fan of the secondary. They're gonna rank ninth. And then the defense as a whole ranking seventh. I do think it's a defense that's going to have some of that fear factor. It's a defense that's good enough to help this team get to the playoffs this year. Now, I have a pretty difficult time seeing them getting back to the 2017 defense that was kind of a world beater and an all decade type of defense. You're really relying on like Khalil Mack getting back to his elite form, which very well could happen, and Akeem Hicks staying healthy, and Danny Trevathan being healthy, and... Jalen Johnson being a really good young rookie corner and Buster Screen, Duke Shelley, Sherrick McManus playing as good as Bryce Callahan, who's one of the best slot corners in the league, and Deion Bush or Tashawn Gibson playing as well as Adrian Amos did in 2018. This is why championship windows with a defensive-minded team are so shallow because all of those things worked perfectly in 2017. And it's just very unlikely for that all to happen again, but you still have a lot of good remnants and what's going to be a very good, intimidating defense. But the big question is, can this offense really elevate enough to be a top 20, top 15 unit that they might need to be to be a good playoff team with a defense that might not be perfect? So that's the outlook. Let's look at this schedule and talk about what my win total expectations are for this team at Detroit, Giants, at Atlanta, Indianapolis. Pretty difficult stretch to start off. I, I think they, they could go two and two, but I've got them going one and three there with the loss against Indianapolis at home being a question mark. I do have them beaten Tampa Bay. I think they match up pretty well there against that team. Uh, but then a really tough stretch here at Carolina, at the Rams, New Orleans, and at Tennessee. I have them going 0-4 there. They could beat Carolina. They could beat Tennessee. That's going to be a big pivotal stretch because the second half of their schedule is not so bad. You got Minnesota twice, who this team just simply put matches up very well with. Um, Minnesota's offensive line just can't really hang with this pass rush. 
Uh, so I do think they'll beat Minnesota twice again. They, they really have that team's number at the moment. Um, but inversely, Green Bay is really built to beat this team as well with a much better offensive line. Um, so I've got them going 0-2 um, against Green Bay and 2-0 and against Minnesota. Uh, but then beating Detroit at home, Houston at home, I think this pass rush can get to Deshaun Watson at home. Uh, and then at Jacksonville, I gave them a win. So a little out of order there. But I have them going 7-9 and nine with a win range of 6-9. to nine. So with seven teams making the playoffs next year, nine wins could get you in. It's about roughly how I perceived this team last year. I will say their offseason didn't give me a ton of inspiration that they got that much better. But I do think the remnants of 2017 are, are still that of a good football team here. So let me know, guys. 23 for this team. Too high, too low, just right. Who do you think comes in next? Please do hit that like button again, guys. Until next time, cheers, and we'll see you later. Peace out.